So on the subject of retro QRP, I've kind of got a treat for you guys. It turns out that this weekend is uh, the Bruce Kelly 1929 uh, QSO party. And uh, basically this is a CW only contest involving transmitter designs from 1929 and before. So kind of the formative years between 1919 and 1929 when hams were using a lot of one and two tube free running oscillators as transmitters. So it's kind of got the flavor of a QRP contest mixed with an old time radio contest. This example here, which is an interesting one tube transmitter, is a power oscillator in a 1929 design. It's basically a Hartley oscillator. It's using a huge triode. This guy can develop some pretty serious power for a one tube transmitter. A lot of people are using much smaller tubes like these to develop, you know, half a watt or one watt output. But this guy can put out some pretty serious power. The 211 triode you might be familiar with. It's gotten a lot of popularity again in uh, the audiophile world uh, for uh, single-ended Class A amplifiers and in push-pull as uh, triode push-pull amplifiers up to about the 50 watt region. As a matter of fact, these tubes are called, or were called back in the 20s, 50 waters. So stand by for an interesting video on the 1929 QSO party using uh, 1929 type circuits, but with modern parts in order to be able to build the, uh, the circuits today. Okay, here's the, uh, the Antique Wireless Association's Bruce Kelly 1929 QSO Party details page. And uh, usually the Antique Wireless Association runs a special event station in New York at their museum. Um, this year they've extended the hours of the contest over the two weekends to include uh, part of the Monday. Uh, it usually starts uh, Saturday night at uh, 2300 Universal Time. And it's on 160, 80, 40, and 20 meters. Now this is a very low speed CW contest using uh, 1929 style stations uh, for the transmitters. So usually these are transmitters uh, such as the uh, TNT, tune grid, tune plate, master oscillator power amplifier, coal pits, Meisner, and any other kind of transmitter from the 20s you can come up with. Uh, some participants are using low power like 1 and 2 watts input. Others are using the full 25 watts. Uh, some folks are using uh, 1929 regen receivers for a majority of their contacts along with their 29 transmitters and they, they're recognized in the, in the contest. Uh, basically any self-excited type oscillator or oscillator amplifier uh, can be used. These are the typical tubes like the type 10 uh, and so on. Uh, miles per watt can be calculated. Enter your highest miles per watt. Uh, there's frequencies in 160 band, 80, 40, and uh, even 20 if you could believe you could make a 20 meter transmitter stable. Total number of contacts are put on the logs that you download and uh, there's uh, the way that you you uh, you score is you you pick your transmitter date like 29 TNT or uh, 25 tune plate tune grid that kind of thing uh, you you put your power out uh, and it's input power so remember it's your voltage times your current to get your input power and uh, you have your uh, your name and your state, and that's about all you put on the log sheet. There's not much to the log, log sheet. Send it in, and Dave, WB7WHG, will score you, and you'll be published in the AWH So we are talking about the Antique Wireless Association's Bruce Kelly 1929 QSO party that's held uh, in November. First, uh, getting your attention with this big transmitter 
You may be wondering what kind of power um, you're allowed to use in the contest. Uh, 25 watts or less input power. So generally with a one tube type system you're probably going to get something out around oh maybe 10 watts if the wind is right and if it's a MOPA, a master oscillator driving a power amplifier, MOPA, you might be able to get oh maybe 17 or 18 watts out with your 25 watts of input power. So that's kind of what people are, are running. Generally people don't run that high a power in this contest though. Usually they're using a one or a two tube transmitter that's using a much smaller tube. And I've got a, a, a little display of the types of tubes that people use in the contest. Far and away the most popular one is the Type 210 or the Type 10 triode. This is a power triode still quite popular and being built today uh, for the audio amplifier uh, world. Um, so again the contest is not about when the device is built or what era the device is built. It's when the design occurred. So this tube was designed in the 1920s. Therefore all of its progeny, uh, the Type 10, uh, being the progeny of the Type 210 is uh, able to be used in the contest. So a lot of these tubes we used to say were developed in the 1920s with the big globe style uh, of, of tube uh, envelope going to the ST style later in the 30s and some of the tubes continued to be made in the 40s and 50s. But nowadays we can say that most of these tubes never died and they're being manufactured again. So, can I use a Chinese 203 or 201 or 211 in this transmitter? Yes, I can, because it's not the actual time of manufacture that's important. It's that the tube was developed in the 1920s. So, let's look at some of these tubes. Here's a really popular one. This is the Type 27 triode. Putting one of these in a Hartley oscillator is a good way to start in this contest. So with these smaller tubes you should be able to achieve something between a half a watt and probably four or five watts output. Uh, the efficiency of, uh, of an oscillator is generally around 30 to 35 percent. So if you're running this type 10 triode as an oscillator at, the, at 10 watts for instance you might get three or four watts out of your little oscillator. Now getting a, a single tube to oscillate on 20 meters in a stable fashion is a little bit tough so a lot of people on 40 and 20 do use master oscillator power amplifiers MOPAs and uh, they'll perhaps have a, a type 27 oscillator driving a type 45 final. The 45 by the way is a 1920s tube uh, very popular in jukeboxes in the 40s and 50s uh, still being manufactured because the audio people love the type 45 this is an O1A tube. I actually have a transmitter uh, with an O1A that puts out about a watt of power and uh, you'd be surprised how far you can get with just an O1A tube which is a, a receiving tube from the 1920s. And uh, another tube is the uh, 71A. The 71A was a, a push-pull uh, triode system uh, used in the 1920s for uh, some high-end uh, radios like uh, some of the Crosley stand-up radios use 71As and push-pull to develop a couple watts of power. Uh, that can also be used as an oscillator too. So that's the rundown. The Type 27, the 01A, the 71A, the 210, and over here uh, we have the Type 45 tube which uh, is also a uh, power triode. Now each of these will have different filament requirements. The 27 actually has a, a cathode, uh, but generally these are directly heated triode receiving tubes that we're going to use as the transmitter in the Bruce Kelly 1929 QSO party. So looking closer at this breadboard transmitter, and it's called a breadboard because many of the early transmitters were actually built on cutting boards or breadboards. Uh, 
you can see that we have a pretty large coil here and a pretty large capacitor. Um, so this is indeed a 160 meter Hartley oscillator. This guy operates on 160 and uh, we're going to be using this on the air to try to make some contacts on 160. You might have watched a recent video on loop antennas that I made. I'm going to be using the loop antenna as the receive antenna for 160 and I'm going to be using a long wire antenna with this breadboard transmitter on 160 and we'll see if we can make some Bruce Kelly 1929 style contacts with this thing maybe putting out about uh, 10 watts of power if we can get uh, enough input power into the type 211 triode. So it should be a lot of fun uh, trying to use something like this on the air. Stand by for some really flavorful CW signals. So we're looking at a type 211 self-excited oscillator. Uh, this is a Hartley oscillator, shunt fed. Shunt fed simply means that instead of the high voltage going to the tuned circuit, uh, we're using high voltage only on the plate, and we're using this coupling capacitor over to the tuned circuit. Thus, those very tempting shiny coils that you want to put your hands on all the time uh, won't give you a shock uh, because you're isolated with this capacitor. Still, keep your hands away from the, uh, from the metal on the uh, breadboard because there still could be a breakdown of this capacitor or there could be high RF current on the, uh, on the thing that's going to give you an RF burn. That wouldn't be fun. Uh, there's additional protection with the output link. Notice there's no connection between the two coils. So this is actually a safer uh, type transmitter than your modern transmitters that uh, use the Pi output with the uh, choke on the output as a safety device. Uh, this 1929 circuit is actually safer than that because it's link coupled. I'm not going to go through the Hartley circuit because it's it's so well understood, but uh, you can see that we're keying through the uh, the cathode. In this case, it's actually the filament, and we're using the center tap. Uh, we have a little uh, filter on the keys on the key for uh, taking care of key clicks. We have some parasitic chokes. Uh, the parasitic chokes and the key click filter may be something that grandpa or great grandpa would have disposed of. Also, as far as a modern power supply goes, I'm using it for convenience, but grandpa would have used something a lot uglier than this, possibly with a bunch of jars full of goop to produce a rectifier or some type of uh, uh, generator system. Uh, but it would have been something a lot more interesting than my simple power supply. Consulting with our radio handbook, we find that the 211 power triode um, is a filament of 10 volts and requires about uh, 3.25 amps of current. And it uh, can handle a plate voltage of upwards of 1250 volts DC. So. I've got a setup here with a 10 volt AC transformer that's capable of 5 amps. Um, during the 1920s many households were being wired with AC and there was uh, between 90 and 120 volts of AC at uh, 40 to 60 hertz available and uh, although this is a directly heated triode you can light it up with AC as long as you use a center tap system and ground the center tap as your uh, cathode in effect. So if you're keying this tube you would be keying the center tap of the two resistors that are connected to the power supply for the uh, filament. So because hams were very industrious and uh, frugal for my two balancing resistors on the filament, I'm using a couple of automotive bulbs as resistors. Now, I do have a variac hooked up, so we'll be able to bring this up slowly in voltage. Now, the first thing we need to do is plug in the tube. And the tube, as you can see, has these short pins and a little stub here. This is known as a bayonet-style connection. 
you push the valve down into the socket till you find the groove and you turn clockwise and now the tube is bayoneted in effect into the socket. The next thing we're going to do is bring up the bring up the filament and hopefully the variac itself is plugged in and we're going to bring up the filament to see if we can get this thing to light. Now already we're seeing our little um, automotive lamps light up. I don't know if you can see them or not. Maybe I'll turn this off. I think you can see that things are lit up now. So we have uh, we have the the tube fully lit up and we have the balancing resistors lit up which are the automotive bulbs. Now it would be better to use oh 24 volt bulbs instead of 12 volt bulbs because these are a little bit annoying. So now we know that we can light the tube we have to think about our high voltage and what we're going to use for our antenna and how we're going to key the transmitter. Okay, some may be impressed by this, some not so much. What we have is the uh, the one tube transmitter. It's using a 211 triode in a Hartley oscillator. We're on 160 meters and I have the receiver tuned to 1821 in the middle of the 160 meter band, CW portion. And let's see how much output power we get. Ooh. Seems like it's going up in frequency as we key. The note is pure, but kind of has a yooping sound. Putting out about 9 watts. Don't think this has much to do with the power supply. It's a thermal heating of the tube that's causing this. Now we could try to change the tap on the Hartley to try to improve the node a little bit. It seems to be a little better. Let's go a little further reducing the feedback. So knowing that uh, running the tube with about 600 volts on it resulting in 25 watts input power and about 9 or 10 watts output, if we uh, see some thermal drift due to the oscillator heating up as we key, it's going to slowly creep up the band. If we use a lower voltage on the tube, in other words, uh, instead of 600 volts, let's say we put 200 or 300 volts on the tube. The tube, of course, is not going to put out as much power, but I think we'll see that the thermal stability will improve. So now I've deliberately lowered the voltage on the plate. We're only putting out about 1.5 watts instead of uh, 8 or 9 watts and the tube is a lot more stable. So anyway, that's just something to learn about these uh, circuits. Using an oversized tube and using an undersized plate supply, we've been able to, to uh, produce a much more stable transmitter. So tonight I'm actually going to participate in the contest, and uh, this is the second weekend of the Bruce Kelly 1929. I just wanted to show you what the log looks like. I made a few contacts last weekend and I've already put those in the log. But uh, do download this. See if you can work a few of the stations. If you have your Hartley oscillator or your tune plate tune grid oscillator all dusty, now's the time to bring it out of the closet, make a few contacts and score a few points in the contest. Next video we're going to actually see some on the air action.